dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Christians are called to live the life of Christ on earth and to continue his saving mission in their businesses, in their families, and in their communities. Christ's mission, as he puts it in John 10, is to come to bring us life, and in fact, an abundant life. How do we implement that in our families, in our businesses, and in our world? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here again. I just love having this chance to be with you and to go deeper in our understanding of Christ. Because when the more that we understand Jesus and draw near him, the better we understand our own selves. A Christian, remember, is not just like everybody else. We're not just people who follow Jesus, who imitate Jesus, who put his teachings into their life. This is a fine thing, but all of that can be done on the outside. A Christian is not someone who's been transformed from the outside only. In fact, we've been transformed from the inside first by being claimed by Christ through baptism in a sacramental seal In Greek, it's called sphragis. It's a beautiful word, sphragis, seal. It's the word that you use for the indent that a stamp, for example, makes on wax. When you seal a letter, you put your sphragis on the letter. And they say in the, in the Bible, it lists that we are, have been sealed or given that sphragis by Jesus Christ himself indelibly in our soul at the moment of baptism. That's just absolutely incredible that we've been sealed with him that profoundly that the person of Christ has marked our very identity. This means that when we then follow Christ as a Christian, we are called to implement his teachings and to imitate his example and to pay him respect and homage. Yep. But even more than that, this is what's so exciting. Your lives are not just called to imitate Christ on the outside. You actually share the mystery of his life in your own soul. So that through everything that you do in your families, in your marriages, parenting your kids, in your workplace, Christ is operating through you in those same realms. Understanding this is essential because that way I don't look at my mission at, in my workplace or my life and my family, my leadership that I show by influencing others in every way that I do. I don't look at that as something somehow on the outside or extrinsic to my Christian life. In fact, this is my mission and Christ will be using me as his instrument to bring his life, his action, the action of his heart and of his intellect and of his power, divine power to bear in society through me. So really the question then becomes like, my goodness, if I took a deeper stock of who I was and understood that Christianity is a question of extending the power and the action of Jesus Christ into this world by everything that I do and even by my person itself, well, then I think I would take a greater stock of my own dignity and how important it is that I use my influence as effectively as I possibly can. Because through me, Christ himself will be living and extending his reign. This is an amazing thing. So before I go any deeper, I just want to invoke the Holy Spirit here. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, 
and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so all that being said then, and us understanding that our mission, our life, is actually called to be an extension of Christ, we, we understand more deeply what this Catholic teaching is called the mystical body of Christ. The mystery of the church, and this is outlined by St. Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? The mystical body of Christ. There's this understanding that you and I belong in a, a very mysterious way to Christ so essentially that he operates through us to accomplish his very mission and to save the world. St. Paul will underline this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when he says, Are, is there anyone here who's suffering? If we suffer, it's for the salvation of other people, right? The others and the members of the body of Christ. And in Colossians 3, when he says, I make up in my flesh what is lacking in the suffering of Christ for the good and salvation of the church, the edification of the church, right? So in all of these things, you can look at many parts in scriptures, but the essential is this. We are not just following Christ from the outside and trying to make him known by talking about him. We instead drink the cup that he himself will drink, are baptized with the baptism with which he is baptized. We are extensions of the mystery of Christ in our world, and our life is carried by his. He lives through us. He acts through us he loves through us he heals through us and my friends he leads through us i guess what i'm trying to say is that your job your role in leadership in society be that in any form where you are influencing others intentionally has a purpose and has been given to you by god so as to accomplish his divine purpose through it he is the king of this world. He is the ultimate ruler of all. Well, if that's true, then why do we have leadership? And why do we rule in different areas of our society and of our families? And the answer is because through us, that mystery of Christ's kingship and his rule will thus be exerted over our society and over our families and over people. He is the good shepherd and yet he anoints his apostles to be shepherds. This is so as a, as a principle that God uses everywhere. And that is that he loves to use intermediaries. What he could accomplish by himself, he chooses systematically to accomplish through others. In other words, like, why wouldn't Jesus himself just have stayed with the apostles? Why would he have sent the apostles to do the work that he himself could have done? Right? And the idea is because that's because it helps the apostles to be able to be closer to God by doing this action that is a divine action. Number two, it helps the people to whom they're sent to, to follow them better. And then number three, because it's a way that God's mercy just superabounds. He is so good that he wants to share with his creatures things that he could have done himself. And so he shared with you this role of leadership. And he's asked you to carry that heavy weight of the service of leadership. And this is so that more than you just implementing Christ's teachings and his laws from the outside in some sort of superficial way in your culture. It's because he wanted through you in your sacrifices and in your perseverance and in your dedication to the betterment of our world to actually bring his saving power to bear more fully in the world. You are a priest in your leadership. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E -E -E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. 
So if we really try to take stock of who we then are as Christians and we try to, and we understand that we are an extension of Jesus, that we live mystically in his sacred body. Well, at the same time, what does this mean concretely? And I want here for us to look at all the different places in the gospel where Jesus speaks about what his mission is. And if we start with John chapter 10, we see that Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And here he makes that proclamation in verse 10 of chapter 10. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now to really understand this, you have to look at it in the context, right? He's, he's making a counterpoint between his shepherding of the sheep and the shepherding of the thieves. And he says, look, there are two types of voices out there. There's the voice of the good shepherd. And then there's the voice of the thieves and the sheep have to distinguish between those two voices. If they're not in the good shepherd and have not been appointed by the good shepherd, then they are thieves who come only to steal and to slaughter and destroy. I came, however, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Okay, so he's immediately putting forth such an image here for us that's so helpful in our leadership. What does it mean for us to lead when God himself is the king, right? It's a little bit intimidating. You could almost say, it'd be easier for me to say, I'm just the servant. I don't do anything. God does everything. Well, that's fine, but God isn't the one that's going to set up the business, and God's not the one that's going to, to allow all the employees to have a just wage. And God, God is going to do it through us. And he's going to establish his justice for the families and for the employees through us. He's going to create a non-toxic work culture through us. He's going to respect the rights and empowerment of women through us. But he's going to always do it through us because this is how God wanted to, to operate. It always flabbergasts me to think about the ascension and the mystery of Christ going back into heaven because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, he overcame evil. And after overcoming evil, he goes, takes his apostles for 40 days of Easter. And at the end of the 40 days, he ascends back up into heaven. And before he ascends, Matthew 28, he gives them the great commission. He says, go ye therefore unto all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. Well, that's wonderful, right? But the question remains, Jesus, why aren't you doing that yourself, right? <laughs> if you're the king and you can rule, why am I in charge? It's like that that, that classic proverb that says, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? It's, it's a hard thing for us to lead. And when you think that Christ could be doing it without us, you wonder, are we just redundant? And of course, the answer is, well, yes. But we're redundant in a marvelous way. We're redundant and completely unnecessary on the one hand, and yet essential on the other hand. We're redundant in that we, we're doing nothing that God couldn't do directly. And yet we're essential in that God willed to use us himself. And so when he comes into the world, he could have come through a stone or a stork, or he could have just appeared on the earth. But instead he chose to use that, well, that unnecessary instrument named the Virgin Mary and be born of her womb taking upon himself her own flesh. And when he does this, Mary has to become a mother in more than just a physical way. She has to give him her initiatives, her intelligence. She has to figure out what to do with him and how to rear him. And we all know who are parents. There are no instruction books when this happens, right? And Mary's not the only one. Peter was redundant. The apostles were redundant. I mean, Jesus is the word of God. Why would he have any human being just be at the, his service doing what he himself could do? And the answer to that is because it is a grace that God wants to give you to lead and to rule in this world and so that he can, in fact, do it through you. It's a grace and a blessing to you because now you get to do something that normally belongs to God. 
and he does it through you. He doesn't, you don't do it alone. But at the same time, he asks us to take the initiatives, to think things through, to use our free will and to innovate and be creative. It's a service that therefore we render to him and we glorify him by that service wherein we dedicate ourselves to his mission and his mission of leadership. Now you could say, when we do that, we become like shepherds of the sheep. We follow the good shepherd, Christ, and boy, do his sheep ever need those shepherds. Shepherds who are valiant, shepherds who are intelligent, shepherds who are zealous, shepherds who try to make a difference and make things better. That's why at the St. John Institute, we love doing these classes for you and, and providing you with these workshops because if we can help you through you, we'll help the 10,000 people whose lives are influenced by you. When you assume a place of leadership in the world, therefore, as a Christian, you assume a responsibility for God's creation to bring it, to care for it, cultivate it, and to bring that redemptive act of Christ into that creation through your own act of service and self-sacrifice. It's an awesome thing to be a shepherd. Well, then let's be really careful, right, about how Christ defines that shepherding. He says that there are wolves and thieves and there are shepherds. The wolves are the enemies, so we can put those out on the outside. But then he makes a distinction saying there's a distinction between a false shepherd, a hired hand, he calls them, the shepherd that comes to steal and to maim and to destroy, and the good shepherd. And he distinguishes them by two things. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep, number one. And then number two, the good shepherd, by laying down his life for his sheep, has at the same time opened for them the pathway to life and life in abundance. This is something that's really unique and new. Christ is calling us to be good shepherds by laying down our lives for the sheep. Now, what does that mean for us who are in secular businesses? Well, obviously, it means a sense of real dedication to what is right and good no matter what. Well, does that mean that we have to die? No, but it does mean that we have to lead and we have to fight to lead well. We were not given this task by Christ, in other words, in order to when the wolf comes and evil can present itself in our workplace to, in fact, flee like a hired hand and not exert the leadership that is ours to combat that wolf be that from unjust business practices to toxicity in the workplace to a job that's done poorly where we short out the customer, where we don't serve our society well, where we don't pay our taxes. I mean, there's a million ways to succumb to the wolf and it takes a leader like Christ to fight for that goodness no matter what and to implement it across all of our practices. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, puts forth a beautiful teaching. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. What does he mean by this specifically? We've seen that it means that a good shepherd does it and the good shepherd's one who lays down his life for his sheep. Fine. But what is this life in abundance that Christ comes to bring? It's a great question because so many people today will, will ask us, why should I be Catholic? Why should I care about Catholicism? Why should I care about the Bible? And the answer is because it gives you a life and an abundant life beyond anything else that's possible on this earth. We define our Catholicism way too uh, smallly, my friends. We, we, we act like it's a thing about following rules or about liturgy or about, I mean, Catholicism is about liturgy and it is about rules, fine. But it's because those two things express a much deeper proposition. I meet God when I meet Christ. And when I meet God, I find my fulfillment and the very purpose of everything that is inside of me. When St. Paul met Christ, 
He changed his life 180 degrees, period. And the same goes for so many other converts. They live a life of dissipation until they meet the Lord. And then suddenly they go into a life of absolute purpose. On February 8th, the Catholic Church celebrates St. Bakita, for example. I don't know if you know about her. She was a, a non-Christian slave who was traumatized as a young girl by slave owners who just decimated her life and took her into captivity where she was beaten and tortured beyond count. She went to six different owners as she was raised and she had the scars all over her body from the severity of the beatings that she suffered at the hands of evil men. And she couldn't read. She couldn't write. She didn't even know her name. She was so traumatized she forgot her name in these beatings. And then when she was taking care in Italy where she was working as a slave, she, she was taking care of a, of, a, of a Christian family and there she was fell in love with the charm of Catholicism. And she made inquisitions about Christ and she was baptized and later became a bride of Jesus Christ herself and one of his consecrated religious. She became a sister and died in the odors of sanctity, being raised to the altars as a saint herself. Saint Bakita. It shows us like the power of this proposition. When I find God, I find the purpose and the fulfillment of every desire in my heart. This is why we lead, folks. It's to bring people into that purpose. To help people to discover what life is really all about. And I have to do that in, in ways that are proximate. I mean, if I'm the mayor of a city, I have to do that by trying to attract businesses into the city to raise the e economy of the city. But I also have to do it by the way that I lead the city in towards service and bringing new associations into the city and helping for just and equitable laws. And, and there's a million ways where in a, in a non-direct fashion, I can, in fact, make my city disposed to the workings of God in the hearts of the people. If we can get a good hospital and a good school system, imagine all of the other things that can take place. Well, if I have a business, it's a similar fashion. I, how do I succeed in the business and make God known and bring God into this world through my business? Well, it's by doing the work well. Number one. And then by creating a workplace environment, that's great. And then think about in your own life how valuable it is when you work in a place that makes you happy and how much of your life goes more easily because of the benefit of a well-run workplace. That's the job of the leader. So I agree it's indirect, right? It's direct for guys like me. We priests... We, we sisters, that's our job to get out there and directly make God known in this world. And yet the secular world, the secular workplace environment is as, as, as important because I can tell people all day long that God loves them. But if my hospital can't cure them from cancer, I have let them down. If my doctor isn't able to make a, a valid diagnosis, then that doctor has let them down. God doesn't just take care of the soul and leave the body go. He ex assumes the body at the service of the soul. And as his grace infuses hearts, so too he calls us in our bodies to order the physical world and the economic structures and the world of justice and the world of arts and the world of government to dispose all things in a human being to this acquiescence towards God. In fact, we make God manifest by, by doing the same thing. If I really want to proclaim God to you, I'll give you a talk that keeps your attention. I'll deliver my knowledge well and in, in an impactful way. It's, it's, in other words, it's a beautiful thing that to be in the world of business. I think that business leadership in many ways purifies the spirituality of Catholicism. It, it doesn't cloud it over. It can, of course, if it's done poorly. But if it's done correctly, what it means is that we have to put our money where our mouth is. We have to 
implement by actions that are true and right and just what we proclaim and we live in our liturgy. Our spirituality becomes as gritty as the work that we have to accomplish motivated thereby. And so I don't want any of you thinking to yourself that somehow the call from Christ to bring life to this world means somehow or other that all of the things that you do in the practical sphere and in the secular sphere are outside of that life. The life that he came to bring in abundance is made manifest in the secular world. It's brought to a shimmer and a shine through the well-ordered machinery of a well-lived and well-structured society and business and family a clean home, a courteous child, a well-constructed conversation. All these things manifest the glory of God and they bring that abundant life to its fullness. Our job, on the contrary, is to not be too small about what we do and instead even open it to this full proclamation of God. Why am I so bashful to talk about Jesus Christ in in the society around me? Society around me is not bashful to talk about everything that it values. And and matter of fact, it's going to tell my kids how to dress and how to act and how to dance and what to look at and how to appreciate life. Why would I let that somehow be the full life that my children are called to, to live? There's something deeper. And as leaders, I'm going to bring that something deeper to full bear. I came like Christ to bring his life and the knowledge of God into this world. And I will not be silent as long as I have breath in my lungs. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.